Hello, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the second day of our joint UI2 and Tanner Humanity Symposium on AI and Ethics. Uh, thanks to all of you who attended uh, yesterday's very engaging talk uh, by Professor Moshe Barty. Uh, I'd like to give you the agenda for today. Uh, we will have six 10-minute talks by university uh, faculty. Uh, the way we constructed this, there will not be a Q&A associated with each talk. We're going to, I'm going to announce all the speakers and we're going to roll through uh, those uh, six talks. So if you do have questions, you can post them in the Q&A. Um, as appropriate to the panel, uh, the roundtable moderator, uh, Professor Valerio Pascucci, um, may choose to integrate some of those into the panel discussion. Um, uh, the speakers, uh, each speaker will be able to see the questions and so they may be able to um, speak with you offline about those. But just for the purposes of the day, we won't have a particular question and answer uh, regarding them. But we will have a round table at the end um, consisting of our keynote speaker, Moshe Vardy, along with Provost Dan Reed and Erica George, who's the director of the Tanner Humanities Center. Um, and that, as I said, that round table will be led by Professor Valerio Pascucci uh, from the School of Computing. And so if you have questions to inject um, you can put them in the Q&A. Note that Valerio is uh, treating this as a roundtable, so he's not treating it as a Q&A session, so not all questions may be addressed, and he may uh, synthesize or aggregate uh, those questions as he's leading that discussion. So let's get started with our talks. Uh, note, um, uh, let me give you the list. As I said, we're going give, to give you the six speakers. Our first speaker will be uh, Lisa Swanstrom. She's an associate professor in the Department of English uh, within the College of Humanities. Then Trafton Drew, who's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Um, Eliana uh, Vesey, an assistant professor in the School of Computing, College of Engineering. Aniello uh, DeSanto, an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics in the College of Humanities. Uh, Alan Kuntz, an assistant professor in the School of Computing in the College of Engineering. And then Bei Wang, the uh, assistant professor in the School of Computing in the Ski Institute um, College of Engineering. So I'd like to thank all six of these speakers. Um, and with that, we'll begin. And when uh, Bei Wang, who's the last speaker, concludes, then Valerio Pascucci will start the roundtable. So Lisa, it's off to you. All right, thank you. And thank you to all of the organizers for your efforts. Uh, thank you to Moshe Verdi for yesterday's stimulating keynote and to all of the attendees. I'm honored to be a part of this lineup um, my interest in this topic stems from my work with the journal Science Fiction Studies, as well as literary studies in general. And so I want to start by acknowledging some potent examples of artificial intelligence in popular culture and literary history. And I would wager that even if you are not a fan of science fiction, you'll be familiar with many of them. HAL 9000 in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 is a kind of touchstone uh, or instance of a machine run amok, even though if we're familiar with the film, we know that HAL acts in perfect accordance with its programming. And if there is any extra human intelligence to be found in the film, it comes from in the form of the giant black obelisks that bookend it. The 1960s also give us the maniacal Alpha Soissante in Jean-Luc Godard's Alphaville, but we can go back much further than this to Samuel Butler's Book of the Machines and Erewhon from 1876, in which machines develop sentience according to the precepts of Darwinian evolution, or to Fritz Long's 1927 film Metropolis, in which a female robot becomes an agent of social unrest. Moving quickly forward to the 1970s, they give us Yul Brenner as an evil robotic gunslinger in Westworld a malevolent computer named Joshua in The Demon Seed, and the treacherous android Ash in Alien, whose severed head is reprised in 2012 with the treacherous android David. Or to the various incarnations of the Terminator in the 1980s and 90s, all the way up to Rick and Morty's lawnmower dog, Ex Machina's Ava, and The Matrix. These are all valuable touchstones to be sure, but now that we've given them their due, in this presentation, I'd like to close the curtain on them in order to introduce an alternative genealogy to artificial intelligence, especially in the context of computational linguistics and natural language processing. There are many um, alternate genealogies to choose from. For example, I've long been a fan of Jessica Riskin's work, which introduced me to Jacques Bacanson's uh, 18th century defecating duck, which is still one of my favorites. But today I want to focus on two perhaps unlikely texts that don't actually feature evil machines, demon seeds, or robots run amok, 
one from the ancient world, one from the new world, one from a sacred text, and one from an absurd text. Held in contrast, they are instructive for our current moment. The first example comes to us from the Old Testament, from the Bible. In the sixth book of the Old Testament, the prophet Joshua prays for a miracle to ensure that he will prevail over his adversaries. God grants his request and a total eclipse of the sun ensues. The second example comes to us from a far less illustrious source. In the sixth chapter of Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, a similar miracle occurs, which saves the hide of the novel's narrator, Hank, who faces execution unless he can deliver on his promise of an eclipse. Fortunately for Hank, his prediction is successful. Although separated by large swaths of time and at farcical odds in terms of both audience and intent, these two moments from literary history help illustrate an important lesson about artificial intelligence as the term is currently deployed in a variety of disciplines. In both works, it is the performance of divination that is captivating for its seeming violation of natural law. That is, the sun's disappearance defies causality, cementing Joshua's connection to God in the Bible and saving Hank's bacon in twain. If we take the text at face value, however, only Joshua's eclipse is miraculous. He calls upon God, God answers. In contrast, Twain's novel depends upon narrative rather than divine machinations. Hank has been transported back in time and is scheduled to be burned at the stake. Because he is a modern man of the late 19th century, however, and an engineer to boot, he knows a thing or two about the laws of physics and is thus able to predict the eclipse and stay his execution. Both events, however, are staged as instances of prophecy and opportunity from which both men profit. Similarly, discussions of AI's ability to parse human communication through natural language processing or machine learning often focus on what appears to be its miraculous capacity for prognostication, if not the inevitable computational singularity. In spite of the rhetoric that suggests that AI are computational descendants of Joshua, similarly endowed with the gift of divine prophecy, in point of fact, it is Twain's narrator, shifty and self-motivated as he is, who provides a more accurate model for understanding such technology. In the case of Joshua, the prediction leaps towards the future untethered by rational evidence. In the case of his less illustrious counterpart, the success depends equally upon the retrospective assessment of the past and the occlusion of this knowledge from the present. Hank's performance illustrates that data forecasting is not prophecy. Rather, it is a science of extrapolation that depends upon probability and statistical analysis. This might seem like a banal assessment, but it warrants consideration. Statistics do not merely anticipate outcomes. They also have the capacity to shape what they purport to measure, control what is to be counted in their reckoning, and elide what is not. Statistics form an effective speculative epistemology, to be sure, but also a sneaky and redactive one. In literary studies, we see a very specific manifestation of this kind of rhetoric in the form of overblown claims about distant reading and the lessons we can glean by processing millions of texts without ever having to read them. But this is not a call to dismiss this completely, not by a long shot. This kind of speculative computational linguistics works. Sometimes the insights it offers are fairly trivial, Sometimes it works badly to reinforce structural racism, economic inequality, and social mobility. And sometimes we get a peek into the all too human workforce who are themselves victimized by it. But calling to dismiss it would be an exercise in futility. To quote Norbert Wiener, the genie is not going back in the bottle. But it is a call to demystify it and understand it and Consider how it operates on its own terms, bracketed from the more corny science fiction conventions that often attend it, and to speculate ourselves about how it might operate differently. So what might this look like? Ultimately, I can only speak from my own area of research. I'm a literary scholar with an interest in science and technology studies, environmental humanities, and the digital humanities, hence the DH, EH, and AI of my title. And in my own work, I've attempted to create a set of tools for literary analysis, for close reading, not distant, that are playful and scalable. 
to make them, I make uh, use of a combination of Python, Flask, and NLTK. The Natural Language Toolkit has taught me how to cheat at Wordscapes, which has been kind of awesome. But it's also provided me a surprisingly accessible pathway for making tools for literary analysis. And today I'll just point out two that are available for free online. The first is the Literary Field Guide, which allows any user to upload a text file and get a breakdown of the words flora, fauna, and weather displayed in what looks like a brochure from the National Park Service. And it looks a little like that. And you can access this freely directly online or through TAPER, the text analysis portal for research. The second is the not so pathetic fallacy, which reconsiders John Ruskin's claim about the dangers of ascribing human emotion to non-human beings in light of contemporary environmental crisis. This program looks for sentences that contain both nature words and emotion words, such as this one right here from Ruskin himself, and then creates visualizations of the juxtapositions between human emotion and natural features, making use of Ruskin's own paintings to do so, perhaps a little bit unfairly. And this is freely available through um, the DFK Paris website. Such small scale tools are not, of course, to the same scale as distant reading projects that claim to read millions of texts. They work best at the level of a single user and a single text. And this is the point and mine. Such technology is scalable. It should be accessible to all kinds of users in every conceivable discipline. And offering a more playful approach within literary study seems to be a good place to start to demystify it. Thank you. Um, my name is Trapton Drew, I'm a psychology professor. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, computed detection and augmented target recognition, which is two implementations of AI. Um, and I thought that talk yesterday was really interesting. And I think maybe this is one example of where ethics and AI uh, are intertwined. And, and they're intertwined in ways that I didn't realize uh, before hearing the talk yesterday. So it's been uh, an interesting experience for me just listening about these things coming from a different perspective. Um, my perspective is as a, an attention researcher. So um, I'm going to talk about two areas where AI is, is proposed to be useful. One is in diagnostic radiology, where uh, we refer to CAD. I'll be talking about that a lot in the talk. CAD is computer-aided detection. And that's where you have a computer that helps find cancer. So it might mark a location that it believes has cancer in it and help out a radiologist. Um, and the other implementation is in the military context, where there's uh, something referred to as augmented target recognition. Um, and the proposed use here is in things like augmented reality, where you could have a target and you could help the military um, help a soldier try to find that. Um, so, sorry. Um, so I'm going to talk at three main points in the talk here. Um, CAD guides attention. CAD or AI, I'm gonna say CAD for AI here because I'm used to talking about CAD and I've done a lot of research in that area, but you could say AI guides attention. Attention is a filter and CAD acts as a filter. And that's sort of a, a logical following there. So I'm gonna take those in, in turn and try to convince you of those points. So CAD acts, uh, CAD guides attention. So here's an example of what CAD looks like in the field where you have a mammogram, um, CAD will mark some location as indicative of uh, likely cancer in that location. And this is really useful in some instances, but uh, in other instances, it's really not useful because uh, when it's wrong, it can lead to poor performance. And as an attention researcher, I look at this and I see attentional capture. Um, this is a paradigm in, in basic science cognitive psychology that we've known about for years. There are hundreds of papers on it where if there's irrelevant information, this red, uh, the red is irrelevant in this paradigm, um, it will distract people, even if that information is totally useless. Uh, and so CAD is really helpful when it's accurate, but when it's not accurate, it can lead to really negative consequences. And so uh, okay, now I'm talking about how attention is a filter. So um, we get more information than we could possibly pay attention to. And so we have to decide what we're going to look for and what we're not going to look for. Um, so here we did a study where we asked radiologists to look for signs of lung cancer, um, which looks sort of like that. These little spheres that are indicative of lung cancer, um, but they miss the gorilla. Right, so I photoshopped a gorilla in here, um, and more than 80% of radiologists miss this gorilla. Right, and so that just shows us that 
you kind of, you see what you're looking for and you miss everything else. And that's because attention is limited. And so you have to, your brain is constantly deciding what am I looking for? And everything else kind of gets down, downgraded. Um, and that can have dire consequences if you're looking for the wrong thing. And so attention, I think there's lots of evidence that attention is uh, acts like a filter. All right, so CAD acts as the filter. Um, so here we have an eye tracking study we did where we had people looking for targets, we're looking for T's amongst L's, but we, we created a task to look like something a radiologist would do. And we monitored their eye movements. And on the right here is a heat map of where they look. And the, the distinction here is on the left, they don't have CAD, on the right, they do have CAD. So these CAD marks, that's the computer trying to help them, but sometimes it's not accurate, right? And the, the take home here is that you're looking around less on the right than on the, uh, than on the left, right? And so CAD acts like a filter, you pay attention to the thing that it's cued and not the thing that's not cued. And we think that this has something to do with the fact that if you look at the efficacy of CAD, if you compare instances where CAD has been deployed in mammography in some clinics and not deployed in other clinics, it actually doesn't help. So even though there is useful information in this AI generated CAD uh, queuing, uh, it doesn't help because it's not um, being used properly by the radiologist or it's not designed properly to be used with a human basically. Um, and so in 2020, Medicare and many insurance agencies stopped covering CAD and mammography for this reason. So we finally sort of came to the recognition that um, it doesn't actually help even though theoretically it should help. And I think that's because you, the, the designers of these sort of systems sometimes forget about the human that is actually using this information and you forget about the, the limitations of attention and the brain. Um, so one final example here that I've been working on just recently is um, I've been working with the Department of Defense. And they're interested in finding bad guys, right? So we made like a cartoon version of find bad guys. We, um, the task is to find people that are holding guns. And so um, this is one version. Another version has CAD or augmented target recognition, ATR, right? And these people are highlighted by the system to be more likely to be holding um, weapons. And this is what we would call a, a liberal version where we're marking lots of things and sometimes we false alarm. And here is a more conservative version where we mark fewer things and sometimes we miss. So here's a, here's a miss there. See that person has a gun, but we didn't mark it or the CAD system or ATR system didn't mark it. And the really interesting thing here is that what you're expecting from the CAD and what gets marked and what doesn't mark modulates what you find. Right. So here we're looking at miss rate. So if there's somebody that's holding a gun, how likely are we to, to miss that person? Um, what we find is that when we're marking a lot of things, uh, you can miss it almost half the time. People would not detect this person holding a gun when they're kind of expecting help from a CAD system, when they're expecting this person to be highlighted in red. And then on the other side, when we have a more conservative system that doesn't mark things very often, when it's incorrect, when it actually, uh, when it makes a mistake and marks somebody who's not holding a gun, you, our subjects indicate that person was holding a gun, even though they were not holding a gun 40% of the time, right? So we're doubling or more than doubling the chances that that kind of error is being made just by how we're deploying this CAD information. In both cases, it's the same information. We're just changing how that information is conveyed. Um, so, uh, basically what I'm saying, or what, what I think is coming across from all of this is that, um, target recognition is really hard. AI can help. Algorithms are getting better and better, but we have to think about the human and we have to think about the fact that AI acts like a filter, right? So the filter means that you can only pay attention to certain things. And when you cue certain things, that means that you're paying attention to that thing that's been cued and not the thing that hasn't been cued. And that means that AI therefore changes what you find, changes what you would have found otherwise, changes what you would have missed, changes what you would have found. And so um, one way of thinking about this going forward is like how good does an AI system need to be to justify these changes? Because you can get in situations where, uh, to go back a slide, this person could have been identified as holding a gun even though they didn't hold a gun. Um, and we have to think about how good does the system have to be in order for it to justify its use. Uh, the end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I look forward to talking to you all later. Uh, so hi again. Um, I'm so excited about uh, being here, about the talks that we have been hearing so far. 
And so in these 10 minutes or so, I, instead of focusing on my own research, I also want to talk about pedagogical issues that we face when we teach about these kind of technologies. And in particular, uh, I want to discuss things that are not going to be surprising to any of you in this audience, I think. In fact, we have heard about all of them so far, but I want to stress how I think are going to be fundamental as the backbone on some of pedagogical approaches, not to not just to computer science students, but to students in general across our curricula. And so, of course, one of the reasons we are here is that uh, we think that artificial intelligence technologies, whether they are hyped or not, are definitely becoming some way pervasive in our contemporary society. And in this sense, language technology is now at the stage where it's becoming uh, we're starting to have a broad impact, not just within research circles, but in several aspects of our everyday lives. And arguably, one of the reasons for um, the success of this kind of technologies has been the rise of these neural network deep learning models that have, we have heard yesterday that sometimes we label black box models. What we mean by that is that these models are kind of opaque in the way they establish relations between the input that they get, the, train, the data we train them on, and the output that they give us. So you could think, for example, of an application that, um, you know, look at my tweets for the last past year and then tries to predict whether on Mondays I'm more probable to want a burrito or sushi. And we would like, in an ideal world, to, start to understand how the algorithm does this kind of match, what is driving the prediction. But given the black box nature of these, um, of these kind of models, we cannot lose the ability of establish precise causality relations between input and outputs. Now, this becomes somewhat problematic when we start thinking about, well, let's embed these technologies in aspects of everyday lives, right? So you might have heard of this debate about biases, and there is definition of bias, like a prejudice in favor or against one thing, usually in a way that it's considered to be unfair. Now the second part, the one in red, is the one that usually is at the center of these debates, the unfairness of the biases. And in this sense, you might have heard, you know, big corporations, sometimes AI researchers make this claim like, oh, we are working on defining uh, fully uh, unbiased models, or this algorithm is objective, so we can use it in like, to make um, legislative decisions. But from a formal perspective, I like to make the case that there is no such thing as a fully unbiased computational model. And I call this the no free lunch assumption in machine learning. This idea that every kind of algorithm is going to have to have some kind of prior that tells the algorithm what kind of information is relevant in the data at hand and what kind of information can be ignored. So if you think about my burrito example, you might think that for that kind of application, considering the frequency of the usage of words in my tweets is more relevant than the frequency of the individual letters that I'm using. And so the, any algorithm that is going to learn from this data is going to have to maybe ignore the individual letters. So biases are not um, mandatorily negative kind of things. They can help us generalize from finite data. However, things become tricky when we start applying algorithms that we don't fully understand, that, that are opaque with respect to their bias, over human-generated data that by themselves are going to incorporate some of our societal biases more in general. So a very famous case of this is in the context of um, gendering of professions. So this is from a study by Pratas et al. in 2019, where they were evaluating this automatic translation system, moving from Hungarian, which is a language where pronouns are not gendered. So you can think they only have it or they to English. Now, in, you can see in the English translation and the pronouns are forcibly gendered, but they're gendering in this way that is heavily skewed toward associating some professions with she and other professions with he. Now, from a linguistic point of view, this is completely unsurprising because we know that in our patterns of daily language use, our, our patterns of daily language use are biased in this sense. Uh, but because the system is um, trained in this way, then it's going to get um, predictions that are wrong in several ways, to paraphrase Emily Bender. Um, they are wrong in a descriptive kind of sense because an engineer can clearly be a she or a they, but they are also wrong normatively. If we start thinking of let's use this kind of system in our translation system every day, and we are propagating this kind of biases that we as a society, we might maybe want to move on forward. So things become even trickier the more um, um, sensitive the technologies that we're trying to use become. So some of you might have heard that in the past summer, um, some prisons were advertising this idea of using speech recognition systems in order to make criminal intent predictions based on the phone calls of prisoners. Now, putting aside the huge issues with privacy that has 
in course, um, we already know without even having to wait for the technology to be deployed, to know that this kind of approach is gonna have several issues. We know from a technological perspective that these kind of system, these speech recognition systems are very sensitive to, for example, the racial bias of the run notators, because they might, some annotators might be more sensitive to some stigmatized variety of English, for example, than others. And the system is gonna pick up on that. And in fact, we know these kind of things without even having to look at the technology. We have decades of linguistic research, and in this sense, I encourage you to check the amazing work of John Bo, that show us that uh, these ideas that we have about some varieties of our language being uh, more valuable than others, heavily affects our judgments in say the lawmaking process leading to these practices of linguistic profiling. And so but again, if we stop about thinking about how this is gonna interact with the way the models are trained, we already can ask questions of what's gonna happen if I actually were to deploy the system in the context of prisoner recognition and things like that. So um, if we're thinking about how diffuse these kind of opaque models are, become, are becoming, it's important to make aware of for general student population, when we're thinking about learning about this kind of technologies, then again, these algorithms are not magically objective purposes. They have their own intrinsic attention problems that are gonna interact in complicated ways with the nature of the data. And so in this sense, it's also important that we start thinking about the fact that technologies are never developed in a vacuum. And so when we're thinking about how we have our, how are we evaluating them, we have to understand them in this, uh, in the context they are deployed in. Um, to understand what I mean by this importance of evaluation, let's do a thought experiment. Imagine that we are back in the 19th century and the government wants to invest in a company that has been developing the best flight technology. And so you can imagine, oh, how are we gonna define the winner? We could say, well, whoever managed to get the highest off the ground for the longest amount of time. That's gonna be our metric. Now, you can imagine that Icarus might enter the competition with these very heavy walk swings. Icarus is not ever gonna to manage to jump like a couple of centimeters off the ground. Then you can imagine something like the Leonardo original machine. That's a very interesting design. It's again, it's too heavy, doesn't have any proportion system. It's gonna crash right away. And then you can imagine that Timmy is gonna enter the competition with a pogo stick, a very fancy pogo stick. And now the pogo stick is gonna allow Timmy to jump say one meter up the ground uh, and to do that several times without, without crashing. So based on our metric, the pogo stick is actually the most successful flight technology is our state of the art. But now imagine that a company comes to you and say, hey, this, uh, this uh, pogo stick won the flight competition. It's the state of our, the art. It's beating all these other things. Do you want to invest in my company? Now, clearly there is no reasonable interpretation of the metric in which we will say that pogo sticks can actually fly. So this kind of extremized example is, um, is used to point out that the metrics that we are using to evaluate certain are not the same as the tasks that we are evaluating. And that we have to be careful in defining the appropriate evaluation metrics, given the complex of the context of usage of the technologies that we think. So if we read in, in the New York Times, these artificial intelligence technologies beating humans and X and Y, what, what were where, where were technologies uh, evaluated and how? Um, so just to summarize, what I wanted to point out here is that these biases can come from our models, can come from the annotations, can come from how we train and how we collect, collect the data we train the models on. But of course, we as researchers are more or less aware of these kind of things, and as well as how complicated the interaction between the biases in all these kind of things are when we are using opaque models. We can kind of infer that, for example, by the increased interest in interpretability of the models, for example, the Association for Computational Linguistics. But what I want to point out that this is not just a concern when we teach about um, AI to computer science students, it's not just a concern of AI researchers, right? Uh, we want our students that are gonna become lawyers and policymakers and doctors and educators to be aware of the complexity of these interactions, even though they are not gonna become artificial intelligence experts. So it's important to remember the language technologies in general, but technologies 
specifically are always part of broader social systems. So if our concern is the, in the societal impact of these systems, we have to start teaching students that we have to consider all of these dimensions. We have to be critical about understanding the models. We have to be critical understanding the data and how the data interact with the models. That's gonna allow us to consider then what is gonna be the impact of these technologies where who they are they going to affect and how? And so that's also going to imply in involving the communities that are going to be affected in our decision making. Um, and then, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Alan Kuntz. Uh, it's an honor to be here speaking with you. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Computing and also with the Robotics Center. And so I'm going to talk to you today about some of my thoughts on artificial intelligence in uh, robot assisted surgery. So I want to start by saying that uh, we're on the verge of a pretty severe crisis, and maybe on the verge of is old news. Maybe we're in it now. Um, and that is, there are too few healthcare providers by far, and it's getting worse. So this is true kind of up and down the medical spectrum, um, from pre-hospital providers in EMTs and paramedics, to nursing staff everywhere, uh, physicians and specialists, surgeons, and the COVID-19 pandemic has made this much worse as well. So this is a big problem. And I do work that's helping to try to address, well, trying to help address this kind of in multiple different places in healthcare, but I'm going to talk to you today about surgery specifically. So where is this problem coming from? So this is some data from a 2018 study on cardiothoracic surgery specifically, but these trends kind of hold um, across other surgical disciplines. But you can kind of extrapolate where the US population is going as we move forward in time, and it's growing and it's also aging. So um, a larger percentage of our population is older uh, than, than it used to be. And so we can start to say, well, based on historical trends um, and these numbers, how many surgeons are we gonna need in order to treat this growing population? And so this group came up with this kind of projection out to 2050. Now, the problem is that you can also project kind of the trends in the number of surgeons that we have, and that's going in the wrong direction. So this is gonna create a huge issue of uh, unequitable access to care. And so, in fact, they anticipate that by the year 2035, the caseload per surgeon is gonna more than double what it was in 2010. So what do we do? Do we expect these surgeons to work twice as hard? Well, I can tell you as somebody who attempts to schedule meetings with surgeons for research purposes all the time, they're working pretty hard as it is. They're pretty busy. So uh, this is not really gonna work. So what do we do? So there's a lot of people who've proposed a lot of different kind of answers to this from a bunch of different directions. And so one of them is that, well, let's make our population healthier uh, so that they need fewer services as they get older. Uh, let's improve access to preventative care so that uh, maybe they need less severe treatment later. Both of these are kind of related, right? Let's improve quality of life for healthcare providers. This could help uh, encourage people to join the profession or, or keep them in it while they're there uh, and many, many other things. But personally, I'm a computer scientist and a roboticist. So uh, immediately my thought is let's automate surgery. How hard can it be, right? What could possibly go wrong? And at this point, I'm gonna ask you to hold your outrage for a few slides at least. So let's think about this for a second. How hard can it be? Well, this is a difficult question to answer, but we can kind of look at other automation domains for some guidance here. So let's talk for a second about autonomous driving. So we had a great discussion yesterday about how difficult this problem has turned out to be, maybe more difficult than we as AI researchers thought it was. Uh, and the varying levels of success or not success that we've had so far, right? And so to kind of compare this to surgery, and this is an imperfect metric, but I'm going to use training required for this skill as kind of a proxy for difficulty of task. Now, that might not be a perfect metric, but it gives us some information maybe. So how long does it take to become a driver? Well, here in Utah, you need to do something like 27 hours worth of classroom training in a driver's ed program. I'm going to call that a month maybe. Um, and then you need six months more of supervised learning. After this, you take a test and you're a driver, right? Let's say that you've just graduated high school and you want to become a thoracic surgeon. What does this educational process look like? Well, you're going to start 
with doing a four-year undergrad degree with a pre-med focus. At that point, you're going to go to med school for another four years. You're going to graduate med school. You're a doctor. You want to become a surgeon. You're going to do a general surgery residency for five more years. And then at that point, you're going to do a, a fellowship in thoracic surgery for another two years. So you've spent 15 years becoming a thoracic surgeon. And this is kind of in contrast to the seven months that we uh, require you to spend in training for driving. So this might be a difficult task to automate. And so I'm going to rethink this last point. I'm still a computer scientist, still a roboticist, and I still want to help. So I'm going to propose instead, we're going to leverage computational methods. And this is frequently, but not always AI. And that is sometimes machine learning, but not always in the AI and robotics methods to reduce the per patient surgeon workload. So this is the approach that I want to take in my research and do. So I like to think of this from kind of two directions. And so I try to create AI based systems that are informing surgeons. So these are surgeons informed by the AI. And then I try to think about AI based systems uh, that are being themselves informed by the surgeon. So um, fully automated surgery, this is the stuff of science fiction as of now. So we still need to do something about this crisis. And so I want to reduce the per patient, per patient surgeon workload in the short term. And so my specific goals are to create AI and robotics driven tools to help inform human surgeons or augment their capabilities um, and kind of symmetrically to create uh, tools that automate the easy routine subtasks under, human, under surgeon supervision and which have learned to be robust from human surgeons. So I'm going to give you one example uh, from my work on what AI informed um, surgeons might look like. And so uh, this is uh, kind of one generation old of the most popular uh, robotic surgery tool out there. So this is the Da Vinci S um, made by Intuitive Surgical. And basically what you've got here is you've got a surgeon at this teleoperation console on the left. And then the patient is sitting there under the pokey parts uh, on the right by the robot. And so the surgeon's interfacing with this robot in kind of two ways. The surgeon has a stereoscopic display that's showing them an endoscopic view from inside the patient where they can see their tools and the anatomy of the patient. And then they're controlling these tools kind of through this haptic interface that you see on the lower right. The problem is that in surgery, frequently it's not what you can see with an endoscope that you really care about. You certainly care about that, but you also care about kind of what's sitting underneath the surface of the anatomy that you can see. Uh, and so typically surgeons get this information from preoperative imaging like CT scans, and then they have to kind of hold this context in their head and uh, reason about what the subsurface anatomy looks like as they do the surgery. And this has led to some interesting solutions. So here's an image we got from Intuitive and my collaborators at Vanderbilt University of a real case in a thoracic surgery case where a surgeon had taped printouts of uh, 3D segmentations of preoperative scans to the surgeon console for reference during the procedure. And so I would argue that we as uh, computer scientists can do a little better than this for them. And so here is one of my collaborators, a uh, urologist surgeon at Vanderbilt who is uh, doing a surgical procedure. This is gonna be a video of real surgery. So if that bothers you, uh, turn away just for a second. But um, what Dr. Harrell's doing here is kind of removing some fat tissue from around a kidney so that he can then operate on the kidney uh, to remove part of it that's, that's got a tumor in it. And so we hypothesize that we can provide uh, surgeons like Dr. Harrell with information about what's under the surface here and reduce kind of the parts of the anatomy that need to be visualized in order to get that intuition for him and uh, reduce the time in the surgery overall. So we've created something like this, where we've got this virtual reality interface that's kind of driven by AI-based methods that register preoperative human segmented anatomy to uh, what you're seeing intraoperatively and syncs these things up um, in a nice way. And so we provide the surgeons with this kind of tool in the visualization, and now they can reason about where in the anatomy, uh, the things that they care about are, and potentially speed up kind of some of the process where they don't have to reveal as much of the anatomy to get that intuition. So um, we've evaluated this. I'm going to spare you a lot of the technical details, but uh, it's been working so far so well for the surgeons. Um, and we've looked at both localization and kind of tumor resection tasks 
but uh, the point here is that we're providing the surgeon with AI-based tools with information that they didn't have access to otherwise, hoping to augment their capabilities and help to make their lives easier. So um, I'd love to hear more from you. So email me uh, if you'd like, or if you wanna hear about more of the automation side of what I do for the subtasks, um, I'd love to talk about those too, but that's all I'll say for today. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all the presenters. Uh, those have been really interesting talks on all fronts. And uh, now we'll start this um, kind of uh, panel discussion uh, with uh, <clears throat> our three panelists. Just let remind me, uh, Moshe Yardi, uh, university professors and scholar at the uh, Rice University and scholar at the Becker Institute of Public Policy. Uh, Erika George, she's professor of, of law here at the University of Utah and is the director of the Tanner Humanities Center. And then Reed, uh, that is our uh, senior vice president for academic affairs, in addition to being a professor of computer science. Um, so uh, I would like to first uh, let the panelists uh, kind of give their kind of opening remarks, hopefully provocative, and so that I can start sparking the discussion. And, um, and then uh, I have a few questions uh, ready, but let's see where the discussion goes. We'll keep it this kind of as informal as we can. So uh, uh, Moshe, are you in? I see you're still muted. Otherwise, I'll I'm here, I'm here. OK, yeah. so as a keynote of our <laughs> uh, symposium, I would like to give you the first uh, yeah. comment, brief comment. And yes. then uh, I guess uh, Erika and then Dan will follow after that. Yeah. So I want to start. Uh, thank you for all the presenters. It was a fascinating uh, tapestry of perspectives. I want to start by reading a quote. Our knowledge of science has clearly outstripped our capacity to control it. We have grasped the mystery of the atom and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. We have achieved brilliance without wisdom, power without conscience. Ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. Amazingly, this was said by General Omar Bradley, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, from 1949 till, till 1953. Uh, at the time, I think he was thinking about nuclear weapons. And many people doubted our ability to, to control the genie of, uh, of, of nuclear weapons. But amazingly, we have managed to do that. There were the world war, the, you know, the, before that, we had in World War one, World one chemical weapons, and we managed to also tame chemical weapons. But we did not see the risk of digital technology or information technology. I mean, I'm a technologist and you say, well, you know, this is just gadget, wonderful stuff, access to information. What can go wrong? How naive we were, how naive we were. Um, last year we celebrated the, 70th, the, the, the 75th anniversary of Van Aver Bush important essay, Science, the Endless Frontier which has very much shaped at least the federal government uh, approach to, to science funding since World War II, which is we should fund basic research because as Van Aver Bush explained, science is good for health, it's good for the economy, it's good for national defense. We should do more and more of it. And we somehow took for granted that more science and more technology more, means more societal good. And I think we need to go and revisit it. I think the assumption that automatically, if you produce science, produce technology, society will benefit is, is a bit naive. We need to think, how do we make sure that science and technology benefit society? It will not happen just because we have more science and more technology. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Erika. Okay, um, we were invited to begin with a provocative statement. Um, I have selected language that will be debated um, at the UN this session. So the UN Special Rep Repertoire on Human Rights um, has done a high-end report 
on the human right to privacy. And the re recommendations coming from that committee will be expressly ban AI applications that cannot be operated in compliance with international human rights law and impose an immediate moratorium on the sale and use of AI systems that carry a high risk for the enjoyment of human rights. Unless and until adequate safeguards to protect human rights are in place, these technologies have no place. So um, in some ways that picks up where Moshi invited us to start, kind of the end of the beginning, this notion that ethics is not enough, that policy is imperative. Um, and I am very sympathetic to that view. In fact, I agree with it. There are policy conversations that are now starting and will be underway that I will note in the chat. Um, but I think it's also important to appreciate what ethics allows us to do as we frame and shape policy conversations. This is a position that is making primary the value of privacy and human rights. If something is designed without that in mind, it should not be designed. Another value is innovation and expression and freedom to do that, which developing computer technology and broader technology could also be. Um, I am coming to you from the law school. The scales of justice are about balancing. Um, many of the questions that were posed yesterday were interested in balancing AI and society. That is the title of this symposium. And, and I would just like to offer the unpopular opinion that perhaps we need to pause. You know, she talked yesterday about inquiring um, who's driving. Are we letting technology drive? I think we need to be concerned about velocity and perhaps slowing down and doing the kinds of due diligence that we expect businesses to do. Um, the other thing I'll state before concluding the opening remarks, and I do hope we get to touch on each piece of this tapestry of the wonderful presentations that just happened. Um, Moshe cited Stuart Russell's The Human Compatible AI and the technology moving in ways that Russell predicted would be incompatible or outstrip in the realm of power that it was able to exercise and control. Not dissimilarly, um, the business enterprise, much of the technological advancements we are seeing are happening in a commercial context. Um, I am low-key self-voting or my recent publication, but looking at corporate governance structures, um, not just public policy and law that is governing um, technology, but the very construction of the creature that is corporate itself, which does have rights. Um, and doesn't have sufficient responsibilities, arguably. So to stop, to slow, to get businesses to look at doing the kinds of due diligence around social issues that they do for economic issues that would impact profits would go potentially a long way or longer and further than we have in the absence of regulation when there isn't political will to actually provide those guardrails. It's unlikely that there will be a moratorium. People will continue to create and develop. So it's critically important that the ethics of asking the questions about AI from the outset are critically important. So Elaine's presentation, I learned a great deal about what isn't being taught or how it could be better taught in computer science departments. Um, as I listened to Alan's presentation, I wondered if the initial question, the truly tremendous work that he's doing, um, does what start with the question, is this ethical to develop? Um, we assume it's good, it looks very good, but are there other questions that need to follow on? Who will be impacted? Who will be potentially adversely impacted? Who will have access? Um, I think these are important conversations to have. They can't be had solely in a computer science department. They shouldn't happen only in a law school. And I think we've been given a great deal to think about by your remarks, Moshi. Thank you very much for that. And by each of the presentations we heard today. Um, so I will be taking the moratorium on all AI until we can figure it out. Position. Okay, thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, all right, thanks. I should first, uh, full disclosure, I used to uh, be head of global technology policy for Microsoft in a previous life. So uh, just, uh, just a word of uh, uh, disclosure about that. Uh, a few thoughts. Uh, Moshe said yesterday, and I won't get the quote exactly right, but I'll try to capture the essence of it that law floats uh, on a sea of ethics. Uh, and that I think is absolutely true, uh, but it is an uncertain and stormy sea. Uh, if it were not, we wouldn't have neither philosophers nor judges uh, because the nuance and the interpretation does matter. 
I will say one of the things that I have worried about for years, and I've talked to government leaders around the world, is uh, a slightly different take on what Erica said, but uh, I agree with many of her points. One of the challenges that we have as we think about law, two points. First, almost all of our concepts of law, at least, and I hesitate to say this in front of Erica, uh, a liar, so she'll correct me if I'm wrong, but most of our, at least in Western civilization, uh, our laws are rooted in concepts of person and physical place, right? The castle doctrine uh, uh, about search and seizure uh, and your home is your castle being a canonical example of that. Digital personas and information about uh, us digitally flow at the speed of light. Well, the speed of light and optical fiber, which is not quite as fast, but is within spitting distance of it. Uh, and so this notion of transnational personas is really important. And yet the global patchwork of laws means that it's sometimes difficult to reason in a holistic sense about those. And, you know, you think about, um, say, uh, um, a Kenyan businessman who uh, stopped in Brussels on a way to, to a trip to New York City, checked their email, did some work, flew on to Beijing. Uh, their persona and information about them is scattered literally across the planet. Uh, and there were some complex issues about uh, applying laws to that persona across that divide. Uh, and part of it is because there are nuances in our global understanding of ethics. They're not quite the same across the planet. Uh, and you can see that if you look at, for example, the European general data protection rules versus the US versus what exists, for example, uh, in China. Uh, I'm also reminded that we learn from history, maybe. Um, it's always uh, the provenance of quotes is sometimes uncertain, uh, but one of them that at least has been attributed to uh, uh, Hegel of the Hegelian dialectic is that what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Uh, and so there are these, how do we uh, deal with this? And I say that to say the following, control of information uh, has always rested in the hands of the powerful. It was true in the time of village elders. Uh, it was true in terms when writing was restricted and reading to a uh, literate uh, minority. It was true in times of control of the printing press, and it's true now. That does not mean that we should not be having these conversations about how we ensure equity. Uh, I just want to point out that history uh, is replete with examples of those inequities, and yellow journalism being one of those examples uh, as well. The last thing I would say quickly about pace of change, I'll relate an anecdote. Uh, when I was running global tech policy for Microsoft, I actually debated the European science advisor uh, in front of a group of Brussels uh, European Union uh, uh, administrative leaders. I started to say bureaucrats, but that's too pejorative. Um, and she was a, a, a Scottish microbiologist, and I, of course, am a computer scientist. It became clear after about five minutes that we were not debating one another, we were debating the audience together uh, because we were talking about the pace of change in biotech and the pace of change in information tech. And to Erica's point, the core question they were asking was how do we slow this revolution down? Uh, and we pointed out just how challenging that actually was. So there are a few framing thoughts. I look forward to the conversation. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, now, I would like to make it a little bit more personal and start thinking about uh, sooner or later we'll have self-driving cars, right? And so the BMW will protect the driver a lot, the AI there, while the Tesla might try to not kill the pedestrians. And there is going to be a variety of AIs and you have to pick your car. So how are you going to choose the, the model you like, and, uh, and in a way, are we in a way creating the evolutionary environment where AI will evolve over time? So I don't know who wants to pick this. Maybe Erika? Okay, oh. <laughs> are you asking that I'm gonna pick the car who kills other people or kills me? Uh, well, yeah, the one that protects you more or that protects more. What, I mean, think about the trolley 
Yeah. Uh -huh. Philosophical challenges like the uh, David Edmonds kind of wrote that book, uh, say, will you kill the fat man, right? The one that would block yeah. the trolley. So what, what car? What, what's, the color, what's the color of the car? You didn't tell us what are the colors of the car. That's how I choose. <laughs> Okay, so you refuse, but I mean, we will have uh, those type of choices, right, as individuals. So, uh, how you yeah. look at the choice of your AI, the cars, we don't look anymore just at the engine, yeah. we look at what AI will drive them. So what, how you will choose? I think we choose based on how many distractions there are in the uh, driver's compartment with the entertainment and communi communication options. That's a whole other problem for humans. I will also note that you know, we don't know how 16 year olds learn how to drive either to hark back to that previous uh, point that one of our speakers made. So this notion about explainable AI, there are, we do have somewhat different standards for humans than we sometimes apply for AI. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it is important to think about that. So um, there are people who have written recently about the trolley, the trolley problem. And they said that somehow you took, we took an obscure kind of philosophical paper and now because of AVs, it just become, everybody think this is the hottest problem. But, uh, you know, imagine, you know, and they have, they imagine you ask people to make, how do you make the decision? I mean, before we have, we want a, 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 a car to make this decision. We should ask people, how do you, how will you make this decision? The answer is, you're not going to get a clear answer from people how they're going to make decision when they're facing with this, when they have to make a, a picture on the, on, in the spur of the moment uh, to do this. And at the end of the day, it's not an ethical problem. I mean, I have a, a, a philosopher who wrote a nice paper, say it's a political problem. We as a society have to make a decision <coughs> on what kind, what kind of technology we want to deploy. And we teach, we teach computer ethics at, uh, at Rice University. And I will put a bit in, in a minute, I'll put a link on the chat. And we try to get away from these abstract philosophical questions. And we, we really try to focus the course on, on social impact, on societal impact, in particular on social justice. We said how technology impact people very much depends who are the people involved. And very often when we see this technology, it, it, the people who, who are doing better socioeconomically are, are impacted differently than the people on lower strata of the socioeconomic scale. So we try to ground this discussion on ethics in not just in philosophical ethics, but thinking about this happens where in a human society, we are thinking of a, we don't have a just society, but we can hope for a more just society and how the technology affect our society. And to me, that's kind of a, a bit more grounded way. And it kind of reminded me of the pre-ethics uh, comment. You know, it's complementary, but complementary to this pre-ethic discussion to try to think about grounding this technology and its impact in discussion about, about social justice. I'd like to follow up on that and say something more about information. Um, we're talking about data and information and the information that businesses have. Um, Elaine's point about pre-ethics as a lawyer, we would call that issue spotting. You're given a fact pattern and you have to kind of spot the problem, spot the risks, um, the potential liability, the legal issue. I think it's very difficult, um, at least from my understanding as not a computer science person, given the black box concept of we don't quite know what's going on. I'd like to see more transparency um, in AI so that we can have information around which to make decisions. Right now, we are the information providers and our information is harvested and our behavioral data is. And with the exception of regulations out of Europe, it's less clear to me that we have information about the information age that's sufficient to be able to make adequate, wise, or well-informed policy decisions. Um, where would you situate that, Moshi, in the work that you've been doing? or the teaching that you're doing, if that makes sense. Um, it, so is it proprietary, the kinds of things that Microsoft does or doesn't disclose to a foreign government? Should it be um, information accessible to us and to all of us everywhere, anywhere we may be? May be? Well, I'll say one of the things that multinational companies struggle with is sometimes finding a safe harbor 
because they can find themselves because of this global flow of information, sometimes in a situation where they have to choose which country's laws to obey. And that may drive whether they even can um, choose to do business in that country. Um, there are real issues there. I wanted to echo, I think, a version of what you're both saying. I think we as academics sometimes tend to latch on to abstractions because we're really comfortable with that. What society cares about are the pragmatic implementations of these things. And so I think if we want to have an informed debate, and I do believe that is the core element of participatory democracy, we need to frame the issues in ways that the citizens see the practical consequences of choices, not kind of the hypotheticals of uh, expanded versions of the trolley paradox, because it's not as if you ponder for an hour, do I turn left or right, and which person do I kill? You will react instinctively based on a lifetime. Uh, and, but the pragmatics about information sharing and where um, and how they affect things, it's also important how you frame the questions, because if you ask them abstractly, you may well get one answer, and there have been some sociological studies of this. If you ask them concretely about specific consequences, you may get diametrically opposed answers from the same people or the same sample. But I think that concrete framing and having a vigorous debate is really key to how we sort out these issues. So I don't know if anybody ever watched a TV show, the, the, I think it's called The Good Place. Yes. <laughs> which was really kind of a philosophical issue. And there is, I think Chidi is a philosopher there. And Michael, who is some kind of a, a angel or Satan or whatever you want, is actually putting him in the driver's seat of the trolley. And he says, okay, you're the philosopher. You have two seconds to decide. And it ended, it ended with blood sputtering on the, on the trolley. <laughs> It kind of makes the same, you know, it's very different to argue about something in the abstract and make a decision right there on the road. But, you know, the interesting thing is that, Dan, you have perspective on this. Who is the, the president of Microsoft? What's his name? Brad Smith. Brad Smith. So Brad Smith is the president of, uh, of Microsoft. And I believe that he is a lawyer, right? And some of them, I would say the most kind of intelligent conversation about tech policy is you hear from Brad Smith, okay? And there you talk about, for example, about issues that you have to do with, with, the, with the globalization aspect of technology. You know, we are dealing, for example, we are dealing, think of the whole issue of cybersecurity. Well, it's a globalized world. This security issue come up, you know, we get attacked from North Korea, from, from, from Russia, from China. Uh, somehow we need to, to start to think about how we deal with this issue in a globalized world. And that makes things even much more complicated. We talked about the stormy sea of ethics. Different culture will have a different way of looking at ethics. In so, fact, um, pe people have done some experiments and putting the trolley problem and asking people in different cultures to respond to that. And answer is you get different answers in different cultures. And yet we have the same, for the most part, Microsoft technology laptop in all of those places, despite their yeah. different contexts, being yeah. deployed in very yeah. different ways. Um, so, I think it was, who talked, one person, um, Trafton, the, the um, sensor device that he's researching. I've got a law student researching the other side of that when it's been redeployed using cluster munitions, right? So the same technology can be used dual use for very devastating purposes if it gets into the wrong hands in the wrong country in the wrong context. So I do um, think there is much to be done around universality. Coca-Cola is the same product, usually mostly all around the world. Um, my understanding is this technology is the same or coming from the same grounds. So um, are there ways to ask the questions at the outset of design and what should those questions be? Whether that's internal to a business uh, or computer science and their individual ethics or the kinds of things that need to inform, inform policy making. Well, I'll just say that's one of the practical reasons why it's important for us as a university, but for corporations as well to have global and diverse teams so that you can get all of those perspectives or at least a multiplicity of perspectives in the room when those choices are being made. 
um, because it does shape some of those trade-offs. But, um, you know, Americans don't necessarily understand what might be appropriate and inappropriate in another part of the world, and that uh, is conversely true. Um, so that diversity does matter in lots of practical ways. And I believe that Barat Misa called for international treaties on some aspects of tech policy. But this is not an issue far broader than Microsoft. Uh, all of the tech giants struggle with these issues. So what I was trying to throw very quickly one last provocation. Uh, it's kind of on the opposite side of now us shaping AI. But so uh, I don't know if you know, uh, remember that Winston Churchill in a famous speech said that, that we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. And it feels like we build uh, this AI social media world around us. And that is actually changing a lot the way we think, the way we act, and in fact, the way we think about ethics. And I wonder what's your thoughts about how AI is changing us as people, as a communities, and the way we think about ethics. So when I talk to people who do you know, science and technology studies, they say that that that's culture determines what kind of technology we are developing and deploying. And then technology in return have cult impacts on who, who we are as a society. So in somehow we're going in between that that it's an interplay between culture, uh, culture and society and technology. And it goes in both directions. We tend to think going in one direction, but it actually it's, it, it's a back and forth. I'd agree. And I think it's very iterative. Um, some of that depends on access, but um, what we have access to, the tools we have, um, how we use them will differ based on our experience, our expertise, and our context. Um, so something that is really tremendous and a true good in one context can have adverse effects and exacerbate poor conditions in another. Um, I think what I'd like to see is a broad policy conversation that tries to equalize adverse impacts to detect them early, to do the diligence that's necessary to spot issues before they arise. And hopefully technology can be a part of the solution to some of the challenges that we're facing in the digital age. Um, I've dropped in the chat just a plug for a policy conversation that's going on now. Um, involving not too many computer scientists as I looked at the list of names involved, but um, thank you. I guess I would say a couple things. One is uh, that I bemoan the fact that uh, so much of technology, at least information related technology has truncated conversation. You know, there's an old saw that says for every question, there's an answer that's simple, obvious, straightforward and wrong. And most of these issues are complex, subtle, uh, and they require in-depth thinking and conversation. And so that's one of the, uh, the negative consequences I see is, is the, the decline of long form and thoughtful communication. Uh, I think it's also contributed to a polarization of society. Uh, and that's a, another adverse effect, uh, maybe a, a one that uh, um, was an unintended consequence. But these are complex issues that will require uh, much debate and reasoning, uh, not only in a cultural specific way, but in a transcultural way. Uh, and that takes time and patience and willingness to listen to people who might have divergent views. That's the essence of, of how we develop consensus. And I worry that we are losing that. Okay, well, we are past the time and I would like to thank uh, you guys for this great uh, round table discussion and uh, this is all very inspiring comments i'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for the great talks this was a really a, a great uh, afternoon listening all those uh, line of research and provocative idea and um, i think i don't know if mike wants to say something here at closing um, otherwise we're um, at the end of the symposium and Thank okay. everybody for participating. Just wanted to thank all the speakers and uh, and the panelists and Moshe for making time uh, these two days. Um, thanks to all and uh, good, hope everybody has a good evening. Well, thank you. Echoing thank my you very much.
Bye-bye.